Brilliant. Um, have you got everyone? Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for the Oxford Climate Society flagship event of Trinity Term. Brilliant. Have we got you, Mary? I think so. Can you hear me? Yep, brilliant. And then I'll just check with Dr. Shiva. Have we got you, Dr. Hello. Shiva? Hello, Mary. Hi, Verana. Verana. Nice to see you. Very nice. Good. <laughs> Glad to be doing this together. <laughs> brilliant. Okie dokie. So I think we're ready to start. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for our flagship event of Trinity Term. I hope you're all safe and well during these unprecedented times. My name's Nathan and I'm the president of the Oxford Climate Society and I'm an undergraduate in the School of Geography and Environment at the University of Oxford. Oxford Climate Society is part of Oxford University, aiming to develop net zero policies for the university uh, and inform the next generation of climate leaders. In addition to our weekly events, we run educational programs throughout the year, such as our School of Climate Change seminar program with leading experts from the university. We also run the world's largest student-led climate journal, Anthroposphere. The theme of today's event is the injustice of climate change. Whilst climate change will impact all of us, it will have a disproportionate effect on vulnerable groups within our society. The poorest people, and often people of colour, are, are likely to suffer the worst and most immediate impacts of climate change. Further, on an international scale, the countries that will suffer the most severe consequences of climate change tend to be those least responsible for causing the problem. To put that in context, the US alone has emitted over four times as much CO2 historically as the entire continent of both Africa and South America combined. There's also a strong link between colonialism and its relation to the climate crisis. It's the idea of sacrifice zones, the reality and the idea that vast swathes of humanity, predominantly black and brown people, are expected to pay the price of climate change and increased pollution. Countries like Bangladesh and the small islands of the Pacific are already um, facing the climate breakdown that many of us see as future scenarios in the global north. So how are these modern sacrifice zones, the product of pre-existing systems of inequality and hierarchy? How do systems such as colonialism, capitalism and patriarchy coalesce to create the injustice of climate change that we see today? This brings us to the question for the need for paradigm shifts, that is, fundamental shifts in the way that we think about worldly problems and how we can solve them. Particularly when it comes to definitions of development and what it means to live in a developed society. Currently, our demand for endless economic growth and our ever increasing consumption is simply incompatible with the natural limits of our planet. And so how can we change our ideas about economic success such that everyone can live prosperous and uh, prosperous lives with, without damaging people's health and the planet? So to help us understand and answer some of these questions, I'm delighted to be able to uh, be joined in this event by two of the most prominent thinkers and activists in the environment, uh, environmental and human rights movement. Ms. Ms. Mary Robinson is the seventh president of Ireland spanning from 1990 to 1997, and she was the first woman to hold office. After her presidency, she served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Ms. Robinson has established many foundations since, including the elders alongside Nelson Mandela and her own foundation, Climate Justice. She was the Secretary General of the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change, and most recently has published the book Climate Justice in 2018. This provides a space for people on the front lines of climate change to share their direct experience with people all over the world. And Dr. Vandana Shiva is one of the most leading uh, environmentalists and human rights activists in the world. She is the founder of Navdanya, which means Nine Seeds, an organization that helps farmers to protect their seeds from the genetic patents of large corporations. Vandana is the recipient of numerous global awards and prizes, such as the Alternative Nobel Prize and the Sydney Peace Prize. She is the author of over 20 books, including Soil Not Oil, Oneness Versus the 1%, and my personal favorite, Earth Democracy, many of which have progressed the conversation of environmentalism and revolutionized the way that many people understand development and, value, and the value that small-scale farmers play in the world of agriculture. So thank you very much for, for joining OCS in our flagship event of term. So we're going to start this event with each of the speakers giving a short speech um, on the topic followed by some questions from myself before opening it up to you, to you guys, the audience at the other end. Um, 
If you have any questions for our speakers, please do write them in the live stream chat box on the YouTube channel. So to kick us off with this flagship event, I'd like to start with Mrs. Mary Robinson. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm really very pleased to take part in this Oxford Climate Society uh, event uh, together with my dear friend, Vandana Shiva. Uh, I was delighted when Vandana kindly agreed to come on my podcast, Mothers of Invention, which I do with Maeve Higgins, where we talked about climate justice issues as we will do uh, now. Um, I'm also very pleased that the theme is the injustice of climate change, which we need to focus on much more. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I, I came to the issue of climate change uh, working on economic and social rights in African countries after my term as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. When I was president of Ireland, I didn't make any speech that I recall on climate change, um, nor when I was serving as High Commissioner did I really lead with it because another part of the UN was dealing with it and I was in my silo, if you like. So it was in Africa in 2003, 2004, that I realized one of the injustices, the disproportionate effect on the poorest countries that are not responsible and the poorest peoples that don't drive cars, don't have major manufacturing, don't have central heating, and yet are buffeted. And that was when there was really little consciousness in the richer parts of the world, in Europe, the United States, Japan, Korea, of how disproportionately this impact was taking place. And over time, I've actually come to identify five layers of climate injustice. And I would say Vandana might have some more, but let, let me start with my five. The first is that one, that it disproportionately affects those least responsible. And this includes indigenous people, small island states, etc. The second one is the gender dimensions, which are huge because women have different social roles. They don't have access to land rights in many countries. They don't have access to assets, to insurance, um, to a plan B. So they have to make themselves more resilient, which was the subject of my book on climate justice to a great extent. The third layer is the one that children brought home to us. And that is the intergenerational injustice. Uh, millions of children now saying to us, why don't you listen to the science? Please do what is needed so we will have a future. The fourth layer is a subtle one. And again, I'd love Vandana to come in on this one. The different pathways to development because the industrialized countries built their development on fossil fuel. And now we're trying to wean ourselves off fossil fuel because we know it's going to lead to the existential uh, threat of climate uh, disaster. So, uh, but developing countries before the Paris Climate Agreement, I know this because I was the special envoy of the Secretary General at the time, they made commitments in their nationally determined contributions, uh, most of them, to go as green as possible, clean energy, but they said, we need the investment, we need the training, we need the skills. And this has not, of course, happened to anything like the right extent. Um, the fifth injustice, and also, of course, developing countries have been finding coal and oil and gas. So that poses a, a dilemma to them because they have to take their people out of poverty. What are they to do if they don't get the support and help that they need? And the fifth layer, and again, I'd like Vandana uh, to comment also on this one, uh, because she knows so much more than I do. Um, it's the injustice to nature herself. Uh, the fact that we have destroyed so much of diversity in our world, the threat of extinction of a million species in a report last year um, of the relevant UN body. I'm now one of the champions um, for the uh, uh, nature-based approach, um, the Convention on Biodiversity, the need to preserve 30% of land and 30% of oceans um, for at least 30% um, as a way forward. And we'll be working on that. And then last January, I was very close to despair, I have to admit, and I'm not allowed to despair because I'm chair of the elders, as you mentioned, that Nelson Mandela brought together in 2007. And he told us we have to bring hope, but I was finding it difficult in January because we were in 2020, the year when countries were to increase dramatically their ambition. And I saw no sign of that no sign of that. So I was really worried. And I uh, knew that we had to meet the uh, standards that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had set in October 2018. 
we had to reduce by 45% uh, carbon emissions by 2030 in 10 years. And all of this was weighing on me. <clears throat> and then of course, we had the COVID, sudden but not unpredicted pandemic. It was predicted we would get a pandemic like this. Nobody knew it would be exactly COVID, but in September last, a body with another elder on it, Grew Brundtland, reported, it is very likely we will get a pandemic, but we didn't prepare. We didn't listen to that warning. And what have we learned from COVID briefly? We have learned several things, I think, that are important. First of all, that human behavior itself matters because it's human behavior all over the world, complying with lockdown, with washing hands, with social distancing, that is the only way to safeguard the more vulnerable in society, elders like myself, and if I may say so, Vandana, Vandana and, and also uh, the health workers and the care workers and the essential workers. And we've learned who are the, the essential workers are, many, many of them women, and they are the low paid cleaners, the bin removers, those who perform the vital functions for society. So um, that's a lesson about human behavior. Secondly, government matters. We're actually going to see cruelly exposed bad government, governments that came late, wanted to deny, wanted to divert for their personal um, narcissistic reasons of ambition or whatever. Um, it, they will be cruelly exposed and are being already. Thirdly, science matters. We're all listening to the health experts. Um, governments um, determine their policy on the basis of what the health experts tell them. We will have to listen to the climate scientists and do what the children asked us to do, listen to the science and live with it. And another, and I think it's an important dimension that COVID has brought about is a kind of compassion. And, and compassion matters because empathy matters. Uh, I used to talk about uh, you know, climate justice from the point of view of the small island states and the least developed countries and even the gender dimensions. And people would look at me and say, ah, oh, well, yeah, but that's not me. They didn't really empathize. It was really very hard to make the point, which is well worth making here, that far, far more people have died from the climate crisis than have died from COVID-19 or will die from COVID-19, far more. And yet they were far away. We didn't see them, we didn't hear about them and we didn't show any empathy. Now, the last thing I would want to convey is that COVID-19 is a great leveler. It's not, it's not at all. In fact, the opposite, COVID-19 is exacerbating all of the inequalities. And it's exacerbating something that's part of the feminist movement, the intersectionality of those inequalities, the, in, the inner intersectionality of poverty, inequality, race, uh, being a migrant, being indigenous, being a person with disabilities, being marginalized in society, whatever. Um, these are all exacerbated, being locked home in an abusive household, the amount of, um, uh, abuse in homes that we're, we're hearing about, and it's really very serious for women and for children in particular. So that's um, a problem. So now that we have to think about moving forward, how do we come out of COVID? And um, it, it is not obviously business as usual, because business as usual is bringing us to a disaster of the cliff of climate, the climate wall. Um, it's not possible to go back to the inequalities that have been exacerbated and made even more evident by COVID-19. So instead, we have the possibility of a new beginning, which begins with lifestyle changes that those in the rich world are learning because of COVID. We're learning what we can do without. We don't need this throwaway society. We also are learning that we have to go the, the route of complete focus on clean energy, and green jobs, but also nature-based solutions. The solutions of recognizing that we need to conserve 30% uh, at least of our land and oceans, that we need to replant, do some of the, uh, um, the, the, the recommendations um, that um, are, are very evident now, the nature-based uh, recommendations that uh, so many have been speaking about, but somehow um, it hasn't quite got the traction. Um, that will all be very relevant. All the financial sector will have to commit to being zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 at the latest. Every investment, every company, every town, every city, every country will have to make that commitment and work in a way that brings us out of COVID in harmony 
um, with climate. And that will initially uh, require uh, spending in order to move from one bad structure of the way we have industrialized to a much better way forward. And that will be borrowing more money, but that's our children's money. And we're borrowing that money for their future. So we have to be brave too, and know that we'll have to borrow a little more because we want to secure a good future for our children and grandchildren. And that to me is part of how I encompass and think about climate justice. And I, I, I have to say, I'm slightly less worried now, believe it or not, than I was in January because COVID-19 has broken the system, which wasn't working anyway. And we have to rebuild and maybe we can do that better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Robinson, for, for your thoughts there. If we move on to, to, to Dr. Shiva. I don't believe it. I have exactly five injustices marching <laughs> <in my notes. laughs> We've always resonated so deeply over so many years. Um, but let me begin then with where you ended. The injustice to the earth. The earth, after all, is living. And it was the fossil age that made us construct a science which Bacon called the masculine birth of time, of conquest, of declaring the earth as dead matter, as raw materials to be exploited. Um, but not only is the earth very alive, but she regulates her own systems, and which is why J uh, James Lovelock when he did his studies, he realized that the temperature and rain, everything is organized to perfection for the evolution of life on this planet. Uh, and then when he worked with Lynn Margolis, they jointly came up with the Gaia hypothesis. So the earth is Gaia and she provides enough richness of life to manage every aspect of life, every need that we have, but because first coal, which then accelerated colonialism and all the violence of colonialism, but then oil a uh, hundred years ago, every war of this last century is an oil war. Uh, finding fossil fuels that nature had put in the soil deep down over 600 million years, fossilized living carbon. Because we developed the technologies to drill and excavate, we thought we were superior. And then we didn't just create a fossil civilization or an oil civilization, but I do believe it led to a fossilization of the mind. The mechanical mind has evolved with the fossil age, the age of industrialism, but it also fossilized hearts. And I think uh, this comes to the second injustice that um, so the injustice to the earth is destroying our metabolic systems to self-organize and self-regulate with all that excessive pumping of pollution just because the mastery of drilling oil deep in the deep seas fracking um, tar sands all of it is about techniques of mastery not of working with the earth according to her laws but this injustice went in hand in hand with a declared inferiority of ecological ways of living, having, you know, I have grown up in India that was a pre-fossil India. I have watched it become a fossil fuel based India. I hope I live long enough to see it in a post-fossil fuel age. Um, we were called barbaric in the colonial times. Of course, we were called underdeveloped, you know, just to create justification for unnecessary worlds. This developed countries and other developed countries were created. And because I started to work a lot in the 80s, when I found that no matter where I looked, if there was an ecological destruction, behind it was a World Bank loan, you know, eucalyptus plantations, big dams. So I said, I always find the World Bank hiding behind absolute devastation. And they created this vocabulary of development. And for every dollar given to the third world, three dollars of business was made. But writing my books at that time for the United Nations and others, I'd go into loans that were given to us. What were the indicators of being underdeveloped? 
that didn't, we didn't use pesticides. That was underdeveloped. We didn't have plastic and now we are drowning in the development of plastic mountains. Um, we were underdeveloped because we used water within the cycle of renewal of hydrology. The World Bank gave loans for drilling deep tubers and Punjab has been ruined. Loans were given for chemical fertilizers and changing the seed, it was called the Green Revolution. My journey on agriculture began with the eruption of violence in Punjab, which is where I done my MSc honors in physics. It was a prosperous state. It was a, um, a peaceful state. And then by the eighties, it had erupted in violence. And the farmers were saying we're living in slavery. Same year, 84, the disaster of Bhopal. I was just reading this morning, a friend sent me a, a sweet little essay on earthing, how we're walking barefoot with the earth, has such huge consequences in terms of our health. And we used to walk barefoot in India and that too was being underdeveloped. You know, one of the indicators of underdevelopment is we don't have shoes. Uh, the third injustice, of course, is the injustice of impact. You mentioned it, Mary, but I live in the Himalaya. I've done a journey before the Copenhagen summit, the Himalayan journey. Streams have disappeared. Glaciers that you be 25 meters thick are one meter thick. In Ladakh, which is a high altitude desert, rain is coming, floods are happening. And people talk about how they're so scared of the black clouds. And because glaciers are the only source of water, the melting of glaciers means the end of life in Ladakh. I have worked with farmers in the East Coast beginning 99, we had a great uh, Orissa cyclone, 30,000 people dead. We've learned our lessons. We, we, ha we had a cyclone just two days ago, the cyclone Amphan. And yet, because disaster management has become so much more um, cooperative and sophisticated, we lost 100 people in Bengal. And we're having to prepare again for a rejuvenation and uh, a, a, a new, you know, we had uh, the agrarian crisis because of globalization. Then we had the COVID crisis with the lockdown, and now we had the cyclone. So this is fast forward to 2013 in my region. I'm from the central Himalaya, from the area where the Ganges comes. We had an extreme climate event and then flooding. And because there were dams being built, collapse of those structures, 20,000 people were washed away, 2013. So for us, when you said so many more people are dying, we watch it every day. But the slow deaths are the deaths due to drought, which don't make good film and good video footage. But I think drought is the single biggest crisis. And it has been created because of this bad model of development, which says use chemical fertilizers, don't replenish organic matter in the soil. Our work in Navdanya, the movement I started, shows that it's 0.5% organic matter. You can hold 800,000 liters of water in a hectare of soil. That's the answer to drought. Um, another injustice is the injustice of false solutions. Uh, in fact, my book, Oneness versus 1%, was written when I saw false solutions being offered in Paris. The so real solutions were not addressed in Copenhagen, and, and the UN binding treaty on emissions was killed in Copenhagen. So now you only have voluntary commitments. And that's when I wrote my book, Soil Not All, because I could make out that even though the figures were disaggregated, land use change didn't tell you the Amazon being was being cut for GM soya. The Indonesian rainforest was being cut for palm oil. That this was a massive, wasteful, fossil fuel-based, chemical agriculture-based, greed-based agribusiness system which was responsible for 50% of the greenhouse gases. And as I've written in my writings on COVID, if you look at who's dying, it's the colored people, it's the migrants who've been crushed to eating the worst food. They have to live on junk food. They have to live on food deserts. And that then makes their risk of mortality so much higher because the immunity systems have collapsed. They have diabetes and obesity and all kinds of other metabolic disorders. And in a way, one could think that 
The same model has disturbed the metabolic systems of the earth and metabolic systems of our bodies. And the two are interconnected as I've written. It's one planet and one health. Among the three um, unjust false solutions are this idea of geoengineering. Because the biggest coal plant of the world, unfortunately owned and run by an Indian um, in Australia, has destroyed the Great Barrier Reef. There are now scientists saying, we will change the patterns or the color of the cloud to reflect the sunlight back and engineer the climate. But they have no idea what else it will do because they never look at these things as a system. Uh, sadly, Bill Gates is a very big promoter of geoengineering. Second is genetic engineering. You can't genetically engineer your way out of the climate crisis. Those salt tolerance and flood tolerant rices that we saved, saved in our Rissa seed bank have helped farmers get back after every cyclone. These have been evolved by nature and farmers over millennia. They aren't genetically engineered, they're pirated. Their genome might be mapped, but the complexity of environment resilient traits are in the plants that are used, not in the one gene that is extracted or the genome that is mapped. The third, which I think has to be dealt with even now, even with the discourse on nature-based solutions, sadly, there is the disease of offsetting. And you know, when they started it in the Kyoto Protocol, of the clean development mechanism, we'll continue to pollute and you be clean and we'll take your cleanliness. It sounded so much to me but like the you know, collapsing Roman Catholic empire where the bishops and all will give you indulgences to keep continuing to sin, but they indulge, you know, you bribe the bishop and your sin is forgiven. So in a way, these false solutions are indulgences of the polluting corporate world and if you look during the Kyoto Protocol, emissions increased 15% and the polluters became much richer. That of course is a totally failed solution. Carbon offsets, and now they're talking about biodiversity offsets. Right now there's a big movement in India where it's called the rainforest of the Eats in Assam, amazing elephant corridor, one of the last patches. And they want to build a coal mine, 100 new coal mine leases. And the, always we'll offset. We'll offset because we plant trees that will die and we we'll plant them again and we'll make more money. And I do think what, whether it's COVID or the climate issue, we can only address these foundational injustices by removing the colonization paradigm and decolonizing, getting rid of the fossil port paradigm including all the categories it created, the category of productivity is so fraudulent because my work in agriculture has shown that when we work with nature, when we work with biodiversity, we can produce far more nutrition and food. We measure nutrition and health per acre. We could feed two times India by conserving the earth. We can heal the uh, broken carbon and nitrogen cycles. The other day, there's some experts on a thing, and you know, they're using the COVID discussion on flattening the curve. I said, the rupture of planetary boundaries is a rupture of cycles of carbon and nitrogen, of not allowing the earth to be able to pull back and not emitting more than you should of nitrous oxide, of carbon dioxide, of methane. What we have to do is heal the cycles. Flattening the curve is one little quadrant in a Cartesian two-dimensional thing. Life is four-dimensional in space and time. So we do need to go deeper into science, but a science of ecology, a science of relationship. And through that, we realize that when we do honest calculations, everyone can live better. The people who live well today don't have to be called primitive and their economy is destroyed. The people who've been trapped into the fossil age don't have to continue to be trapped. We can all shift from measuring GDP to measuring happiness as the state of Bhutan has done. And shifting from the circulation of money to the circulation of life and improving the well-being. Uh, and when I say this for me, these are not theoretical questions. This is what I do on a daily basis. And I know it's totally doable. And if the whole world went organic, I would say we don't need 30%. 
I think every farm should be biodiverse. I'm so glad the European Union has said at least 50% reduction in pesticide and biodiverse farm. 100%. I launched a bio poison free campaign. 100% of the land should have gardens. Pavement should have gardens. Balconies should have gardens. Schools should have gardens. And they'll give us more food. They'll regenerate biodiversity. They'll bring back the disappearing insects. But most importantly, many, many, many millions of gardens act together will have the capacity to draw down that excess carbon and nitrogen and heal the cycles. Brilliant. Thank you both very much for your opening uh, speeches. And that sets us up well for our first question, which is, um, I want to just link so, uh, the, the struggle of climate change and the, and the social movement there to some of the social movement that you started when you first embarked on your careers. Um, so if you could sort of take us through, um, you know, when you were younger, perhaps uh, coming out of um, your degrees, what were some of the social struggles that you first embarked on and how did they merge through time with that of the climate struggle and the, and the climate crisis? I go first this time. Yeah, Mary, if we okay. tell you. Um, well, I studied law as an instrument for social change. I wasn't interested in making money from law. I wanted to make change. And so I spent a lot of time as a lawyer taking the kind of cases that would uh, change inequalities for women in particular, but also, uh, we had a very Catholic dominated country and our laws reflected that. Uh, I, the first measure when I was elected to the Senate at the age of the Irish Senate at the age of 25, my first major step was to introduce a private member's bill to legalize family planning in 19, late 1970, early 1971. It caused a complete reaction that I would never have anticipated. Uh, I, was, I became a hate figure. I got terrible hate mail, um, uh, so much so that my husband, we, we were married in December 20, 1970, um, he uh, burned these papers. And we now regret that because we're archivists and it, it was a loss of that kind of social uh, indicator of, of the Ireland of 1970 and beyond. Um, and eventually, uh, nine years after we had initially tried, there was a a sort of um, bill uh, to promote family planning. And Ireland has come on wonderfully since then. We now had the same-sex marriage referendum and we got rid of the prohibition on abortion in our constitution, which had equated the life of the fetus and the life of the mother, which meant that so many women died um, because of bad law or bad constitutional amendment. I fought against that. I, I did a filibuster in the Irish Senate on that. I also, uh, was very interested in uh, human rights issues. Uh, I took cases on homosexuality, on various issues, not just before the Irish courts, but also before the courts in Luxembourg of the European Union and in, in the courts in Strasbourg. So when I became president, it was different because I was a non-executive president, sort of outside politics, but elected by the people. So I had that mandate to try to give a kind of leadership. And I found it initially quite difficult. And then I realized that by embracing the ordinariness of women's lives, um, I said I wanted women who'd been outside history to be written back into history. And I used a line from my dearly beloved friend, Ivan Boland, the poet, who died very recently, finding a voice where they found a vision. And uh, that was a way of uh, recognizing that uh, women in their lives were actually uh, doing extraordinarily resilient work um, in rural Ireland and not being noticed or credited for it and so on and so on. Um, but they were the main thing. The only other thing that I also marched for early on and now have a great concern for as chair of the elders is the nuclear issue. I cannot understand why young people now are not out on the street desperately marching and campaigning for sanity to prevail because we are in the worst moment. Uh, I was with uh, my fellow elder Ban Ki-moon, he's actually my deputy now. He was my boss for three mandates for the Great Lakes and two mandates on climate change. And now he's my deputy and very supportive of the fact that I'm a woman who's his chair and he's my deputy. But we were at the Doomsday Clock event in January in Washington. And the Doomsday Clock is the nearest it has ever been to Doomsday, a hundred seconds. And that's ind ind indicative of the climate crisis, the um, uh, 
uh, nuclear issue, but also the disruptive technologies that we have that Shiva has been, or Vandana has been, been talking about. Vandana? So because you mentioned nuclear, you know, I was training to be a nuclear physicist and I was training in India's um, Atomic Energy Commission in the fast breeder reactor while it was going critical. I came home and showing off, of course, and my sister who was a doctor just asked a simple question. And what about the radiation? And I had no idea because they don't teach you that in physics. They just teach you how to work out the energy for train, chain reactions. So I left nuclear physics, went into theoretical physics, was trying to do a PhD in particle physics, but my mind kept going to the foundations of the of field theory, quantum mechanics. So I did a PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. And before leaving, I just wanted to carry a bit of my home with me. So I came to the back to the Himalaya, did a quick trek, went to what I thought would be an oak forest that I'd walked and swim in a stream that came from the oak forest. And the oak forest had been replaced by an apple orchard that had failed. Uh, and the stream was a trickle. And that's, you know, I really felt part of me had been chopped off because I'd grown up in the Himalayan forest. And uh, while chatting with a dhaba wala, a chai wala, you know, waiting for the bus back to Delhi, I was talking about how disturbed I was. And he said, but now we have hope, Chipko has started. So Chipko means to hug and it's the movement of women who said, we're going to hug the trees. You'll have to kill us before you kill the trees because these are our mothers. And the slogan that time in the seventies was, these are not timber mines. These trees, the first product of these forests is soil, water, and pure air. When we had flooding, then the government said, oh, I, we understand the soil water, but the pure air is still crazy. Till we had climate change, now they're realizing that the link of forests and uh, the whole issue of, of climate is so interconnected. So I had to leave for my PhD, but I took a pledge that I would come back every vacation and volunteer for this amazing movement. And from the women of Chipko, I learned so much. I learned my first lessons of biodiversity from them. You know, I might have done my PhD at the University of Western Ontario, but my real PhD in life and biodiversity and interconnections is in the Chipko University where the women had never been to school, but they lived the life of the school of the earth and the school of life. Um, in uh, Western at London, I remember it was the period where the fights against apartheid would grow strong and we had a very small group of uh, coalition for change it was called. And when Steve Biko was murdered, Rothman was financing an art exhibition on the campus. And I remember we were about eight of us and we carried a coffin of Steve Biko. And of course there were 500 policemen, you know, it's always crazy, a small group of people with conscience act and they're always 500 policemen. Same happened, Coca-Cola, women called me and said, come and celebrate our day with us. Tribals, I said, what are they doing fighting Coca-Cola? Went and found Coca-Cola mines 1.5 milliliters per day and had left a water famine. Again, 100 women, 500 policemen. And so I lent support to them. Um, I think it was in 1985 at the Women's Summit at uh, Nairobi that um, I, I was by then making the connections between ecology and feminism and Mangari and I led a whole session on women and environment. And that's how my book, Staying Alive, uh, grew out of that, my, you know, the, my publisher, she said, you got to write. I said, I chucked university, I don't write, I don't publish, I'm not in the rat race. And she said, but writing can be subversive. So I have now written so many books as part of movement building, as part of really creating hope in times of hopelessness. Um, so those convergences that women's knowledges, women's work that have always been left invisible are really the place to shift. The economies of caring and sharing are the economies of the future, the economies of grabbing and extraction and calling extraction growth. I think the biggest, real, biggest illusion is how every indicator of extraction. And then of course, my the latest with seed when these companies said we're going to um, do GMOs to own the seed through patents and have an international law in WTO to force everyone to patent seed. I said, no, you, you don't invent a seed. A patent is granted for an invention. A seed is not your invention. The seed is not a machine. I'm going to save seeds. And I worked with my government. It was a different period. It was 
governments that were not captured then by corporations, you know, I, I call it the pre-corporate state period, where we wrote an amazing law, patterns. We said, what is not an invention? Plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. Therefore, they can't be patented. And that law has protected biodiversity in India. It has protected farmers' rights in India. And of course, I've continued to do agroecology more to save the seed. And now we find it's the best way to solve the climate problem, solve the desertification problem. Um, so I mean, the point is when you don't, when you're not working from instruction of power and you're working on instructions from the earth and from your conscience, then these rivers keep meeting in a very natural confluence. Great, thank you. And that, and that leads us on to the, to the next question really well, which is that of colonialism. So the fossil fuel powered economy requires this idea of sacrifice zones, which for anyone who doesn't know, is vast groups of uh, people or geographical areas that are expected to sacrifice their health, their livelihoods, their homes, for example, at the expense of the emissions of wealthier nations. And, and the idea goes that you can't have a system built on sacrificial places or sacrificial people unless you have the underlying intellectual theories to justify them. And so my question, perhaps to Vandana to start, is how is colonialism intrinsically related to both creating climate change, but also how it's used to justify these modern sacrifice zones that I've, that I've mentioned that we see today? So, you know, till the mid 500 years ago, India was the most prosperous economy and we were engaged in international trade. And that's why Columbus was being sent here and uh, all the indigenous people of America are called Indians because he thought he had landed in, in India. Um, and then the East India Company uh, was created again for India, 1600. That time there was no fossil fuels, but they created an empire. And then when the coal was able to run their steamships to go further, uh, to run the industry, what happened basically was they realized they could capture all of North America and turn it in the southern part into cotton plantations. But to run those cotton plantations, they grabbed Africans and turned them into slaves and took them in ships. India was enslaved, you know, I've, I've grown up um, in an India that became free, but indigo cultivation was a slave cultivation, which is why Gandhi in 1917 joined, when he returned from South Africa, he joined the movements against Indigo cultivation where people were saying, we'd rather die than grow Indigo. Um, so how did the, this genocide get interpreted as just? Because the colonizing powers created civilizing missions. In that period, the civilizing mission that was used by the Spanish was religion. And the hierarchy was God tells the Pope, tells the King and gives power to Columbus. But for the East India Company, they didn't even waste their time with religion. It was pure commerce, military operation. And if you look at the charter of the East India Company, you will understand the kind of powers that were granted to them. Uh, so genocide was legitimate because you de de declared yourself superior, a superior race, a superior religion, and, uh, and declared all the others primitive. You were in fact, in killing them, you were delivering them. And civilizing missions haven't stopped. In my book, Oneness Versus One Percent, I've talked about how they're new civilizing missions and they're no new religions. That time it was commerce, but now it's money making for the sake of money making and new magical ways to make money out of, you know. I mean, look at the way BlackRock has increased its assets by 23 trillion during this corona epidemic. Or Jeff Bezos, 34 billion. So we are talking of a whole new way in which, and you know, I say this sometimes, I say, you know, in that period they needed a God and they needed a Pope and they needed Kings and they needed adventurers. And now the billionaires who rule the world 
are playing God, <laughs> you know, if you don't want to totally engineer the climate of the planet, you're playing God. You want to genetic engineer everything, you're playing God. You are the Pope because you're writing the new religions. You are the merchant adventurer sailing out. You are the king and queen. You are basically telling governments what to do. And I don't have to give you too much detail about how the governments are not making decisions anymore, not about food, not about health, not about um, economy. And I think this is the challenge, you know, it, I am a senior citizen uh, like Mary, but it doesn't mean we are going to stop because fighting injustice is in our very, you know, in our blood, in our soul. But for your generation, these amazing challenges are challenges in which you have to think of the fact, okay, so what's the new slavery? What's the new genocide? What's, what's the new decision about how many people can be thrown away? Half of India has just been thrown away in the lockdown, marching home on the roads, marching, marching, marching. And, and an India with a constitution that we have doesn't really permit it. So what has allowed it to happen? It's not the pandemic alone because there are other ways to manage the pandemic than throw people away in millions. According to the ILO, Mary, it's 1.9 billion will lose their work and livelihoods of the 3.3 billion working people. That's half of humanity just trashed. And then you add the vulnerabilities of climate change, you can imagine what it'll do. And just to add to that before, um, for Mary, um, just touching on those points about the role of government um, and how it's slowly shifting um, in our food systems, for example, how it's slowly shifting to private corporations. Can you can you uh, discuss perhaps with reference to the COVID um, crisis that we're seeing at the moment, the shift, perhaps the shifting dynamics between the role of the government and private enterprises that Vandana touched upon? Well, yeah, first of all, um, just to touch a little on the colonialism idea. I mean, my country also, was colonized by our mm -hmm. neighbor and struggled. And we became part of an ambivalence because Irish people were also part of that colonizing in other countries, you know, becoming civil servants, judges on the colonial service, et cetera. So half my family were rebel, half my family were judges on the colonial system. You know, that was what it was to be Irish. So kind of divide. Uh, I just want to tell you a lovely story because in a way, uh, I, I think it's a kind of, uh, it's an interesting story. When my country was suffering the worst famine in the middle of the 19th century, it began in 1845 when the potato crop failed, 1846 was terrible, 1847 was disastrous. People either died or emigrated and it was really, really bad. And the Choctaw people met uh, um, 10 years after they'd left their tribal lands to mourn having to leave. And they heard, we think from a passing priest, about an island far away where people were starving. And they raised $173. This was in 19, 1847, $173 and sent it to the relief of Irish victims. And um, we know because of the Victorian bookkeepers, uh, the British regime, that the money came in and actually was dispersed to help starving poor peasant Irish. Fast forward, there is now a movement in Ireland to support some of the Indian reservations that are worst hit in America with the COVID because they have bad health systems, they've had all kinds of problems, which are problems of exactly what we're talking about. And um, nobody could understand at the beginning why Irish money was flowing, but people remember that story and it's, it's part of our culture. And we honor the Choctaw people in a particular way. And as, as president, I went, went to Oklahoma in 1997, 150 years after this, to thank the Choctaw people for that humanity and a sense of empathy with a starving island population far, far away and no real connection. Anyway, I just wanted to tell that story because we also have to remember the kind of humanity that you know, can, can bring us through um, these um, crises. Um, but to the point about, uh, you know, the, the, the private sector, I don't think, I'm not prepared to write off entirely um, the capacity of 
um, business leaders to be part of a solution. They have to be in our world. I'm part of the B team of business leaders who are committed to be zero carbon in their um, uh, companies and in their supply chains by 2050 and do it the climate justice way with just transition. And they began the whole discussion at the moment, which is so important on just transition so that the workers in the coal, oil and gas don't get shafted now um, when we start moving rapidly into clean energy, but actually have a just transition. And so it's a complex business. I, I also think that COVID has reminded us that government matters. I'm actually more hopeful that we will see that we need government, we need health systems, we need education systems, and we need to become more resilient. So I prefer to build in that direction. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and so just to build on, so from one injustice to another, um, we obviously know that the most marginalized and it's the poorest who uh, will face the greatest and most immediate effects of climate change on a global scale, but also on a uh, national scale. Um, and I just wanted to ask, um, is it merely a geographical coincidence that the locations that are most effective are also some of the poorest, um, or is there more to it? In other words, to what extent is um, this phenomenon uh, a product of natural laws, such as physics, or a product of pre-existing social structures or that of uh, human created systems? So where's that balance um, is the question. Mary, if we could stop. Okay, well, I see COVID as being initially uh, a health pandemic crisis, but it's also a, a, an economic crisis, a social crisis, a behavioral crisis, you know, um, but it's hitting poor countries and poor populations and large poor populations disproportionately because they don't have strong health systems to address that issue. And, and that's, um, that's a problem, but even, you know, look at the United States. It has a very, very poor public health system. It has great public health experts, but somehow the overall system has been completely capitalized in the wrong way. Um, it's a it, diseases of the rich are catered for. Um, there is not a good public health system. And it is showing now in the fact that, and also um, there's no social safety net like there is in most of Europe. Um, by and large in the United States. Now they have poured some money in, but still you are seeing queues for food parcels in the United States because it lacks that, that sense of a society that's, you know, um, that, that's kind of more than um, an economic machine. Well, you know, if you think of, uh, you know, whether it's COVID or climate, I see both as anthropogenic, you know, they've been created by human actions yeah. of a particular group of people. Uh, if you think of the vulnerability in India, it's the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. But Bengal was the richest part of the world mm. because, you know, all of the soil fertility of the Ganges come to deposits all the time the amazing monsoons, four seasons of cultivation. I've had these constant debates with agricultural experts who measure one crop versus a field in one season, not multiple crops of biodiversity over four seasons. They don't have that capacity. Even now, you know, our communities of women in Bengal, they have tiny little acreages because we've had huge movements. If you might remember, and famine, you know, we share the famine story of Ireland. Um, India lost 60 million. 60 million people were part of the sacrifice of extracting Lagan. You might remember Amir Khan's famous film, extracting rent from the land and leaving people to die. The Great Bengal Famine was a trigger for our freedom, 1942. And the women started a movement, Jan de Bodhan de Bodhan. We won't give you our rice. We'll give our life rights. And you're standing with brooms in front of the bayonets of the police and the military. And, uh, and the land reform movement started. And even now people have very tiny parcels of land, but because nature is so abundant and they work with biodiversity, they are able to constantly build back. So the existing zones of poverty 
and the existing sacrifice zones are basically zones of remnants of extraction, of the extraction of wealth. And the extraction of wealth was colonialism, but uh, development was just the continuation of colonialism. Neoliberal globalization put it all on fast forward. And if you think of it in these 30 years, poverty has grown, the refugees have grown. Why are all the time people having to move from their homes? Because an of agriculture that's invading your soil for fertility, we did a manifesto called Terra Viva to try and understand the combination of the soil deterioration, the climate and the refugees, because that was the time boats were sinking in the Mediterranean, carrying refugees from Africa. And what we found was whether it was Syria in 2009, they'd had an amazingly long drought. And before that, like the green revolution, all the water had been mined. There were monocultures of chemical agriculture, all collapsed. A million farmers moved to the city, 70, 5% of the animals died. Boko Haram was created, similar impact, Lake Chad disappearing. So, so many of the displacements are related to continuing on a model of development that is constantly creating and deepening sacrifice zones. And that's why the shift in the model is vital, no matter what your passion be. Your mad passion could be climate justice, your passion could be food rights, your passion could be the right to work, your passion could be justice for immigrants, but all of it is connected. And it's connected to this very, the continuation of colonialism by new names and the need to create freedoms in multiple ways. We, of, of course, the role of government is so important, but nothing says government has to be a centralized Hobsonian government. India, the land of Gram Swaraj, the state which had the best success in managing COVID was Kerala. The health minister was front page of Guardian because over these years, they built local government. Local governments make decisions. They made health universal. They made education universal. They made land reform so that the poorest woman's hut is on a land she owns. This combination did two amazing things created a structure of governance that can respond to mega crisis, two years of flooding with climate change, and now the COVID, but it's the only place where you had a negative growth in population. Population control doesn't come through violence against women's bodies, it comes through justice. Brilliant, thank you, and I'm just cautious. I, I do very much agree with that point about governance, I didn't, explain it, but I, I write down to, to the local and all the better, yep. Brilliant, so I'm just aware of time. So uh, one more question I think from myself before we go to the audience. Um, and this one's about climate solutions, which bo both of you have touched on. Um, so many corporations such as Monsanto and, and Car Cargill, if I'm saying that correctly, um, promote flood tolerant or drought resistant crops through genetic engineering um, as solutions to the threat of climate change and the threat that it poses to agriculture. But what many people don't know is that uh, they collect royalties, these companies collect royalties from low income fa farmers, entrapping them into debt and often endless cycles of poverty. Um, so, on this interconnected um, issue of providing climate solutions, can you um, perhaps explain how they may have hidden um, costs? Um, so, for, for Dr. Shiva, perhaps if you could talk about the effect on farming communities. And for Mr. Robinson, could, could you perhaps talk about? the effect on human rights, um, Mayor of Hoot. Yeah. So as I mentioned already, you cannot genetically engineer complex genetic traits. The only thing that the companies have been successful in doing is introducing toxic traits for Roundup resistance or for Bt toxin. And these two have failed to control weeds and pests. They've created super pests and super weeds. Complex traits of disease resistance, climate resilience cannot be engineered. But what is done is a genome mapping. There's actually a, a casino taking place. They steal the seeds, then they run through all the flood resistance seeds. And then they say, oh, maybe we, let's do a guesswork with algorithms, it's called athlete. Maybe this part of the genome, maybe we can make a guess in a lottery ticket that this is what leads to flood tolerance or soil tolerance. And then they patent it. Uh, so 
It's a false solution for two reasons. First, because farmers have these seeds, this is what Navdanya seed banks are about. We have flood tolerant, soil tolerant seeds, and we multiply them and share them and they're in community seed banks, which means when a disaster happens, they're available for free. The Orissa farmers provided two truckloads of soil tolerant seeds to the Tamil Nadu farmers when the tsunami made their land support. And you know, the government had said five years of a holiday for agriculture because there's too much salt. We said, no, we'll bring you salt tolerant seeds. They said, can't be. We brought two truckloads of salt tolerant seeds. So keeping seed in the commons is vital because every patented and genetically engineered seed means royalty. And we've seen what they did to the BT cotton. Farmers were trapped in debt. Of the 400,000 farmers suicides in India, 85% are in the cotton area. The Competition Commission of India assessed that it is a virtual monopoly of Monsanto. The price of seed used to be five rupees a kilo before Monsanto got in. Five, 10, they jumped it to 4,000 rupees a kilo. And this was extracted from the farmers, which is why they got into debt, which is why they ended up committing suicide. Here too, it's failing. The boll worm has become resistant. The organic seeds that we saved in the community seed banks are spreading. Farmers are growing organic cotton. They're earning 10 times more by using their own seeds. And Monsanto last year lost 12 million because farmers have shifted to their seed sovereignty. So not only are those solutions unjust, but they're false because there are better ways to keep seed in the commons and share them freely. But can you imagine if there's a disaster and you have to wait for Monsanto to bring their seeds and among the impoverished farmers who have nothing left, everything was destroyed, they're then going to extract royalty. They are actually putting an economic disaster on top of a climate disaster. That is why I have always said seed is not patentable. We've achieved it in India in law. Across the world, we are building movements that seeds freedom is the basis of food freedom, is the basis of climate resilience, and we must not let monopolies emerge on seed. Maybe the best way I could respond is by looking more broadly at business and human rights, because that's an area that I've worked in over a long number of years, particularly when I was high commissioner and since then. And uh, we didn't, initially when I became high commissioner for human rights, it was states who were responsible to protect and uh, fulfill human rights. Corporate responsibility was not established. Uh, we then got the UN guidelines on business and human rights which are still only guidelines, unfortunately, but they are very significant because they um, made it clear, and this was the Human Rights Council voting unanimously for this, that all corporations have a responsibility to respect all human rights. Now, this is a lovely statement, and it's one that isn't fulfilled in reality in many, many cases, but the fact that it's there, and if we could make it stronger. Now, the EU, the new, Justice Commissioner has said that there will be an EU law on human rights and due diligence for corporations. That would be very significant. But um, what, what, we are, uh, what, what we have to be looking at is not just the existing uh, problems, especially for defenders of land rights and uh, water rights that Bandana would also know very well, how many are killed, how many families are destroyed, um, their homes imprisoned, et cetera, et cetera especially in Latin America, but it's also, I think, a problem in other parts. Um, but I'm learning and, and I have been pointing up a new dimension of problems with clean energy. There are very big human rights violations now by many who are putting in clean energy the wrong way. Large mega dams, large mega solar systems that don't help the indigenous peoples, etc. There's a very nice case that I'm aware of in Kenya, where the largest wind farm in Kenya was being um, uh, put up over Maasai land, but they didn't know that Maasai's had land. There, there were no, there was no question of their rights, etc. And 
the, the benefit of the, of the clean energy would not go to the Maasai. But luckily, they got a good lawyer and stopped it in court. And you know, it's, they've had to rejig. And you know, that was an interesting example. But um, it, it, there, there's a really, there's a need for the, uh, uh, somehow for the clean energy system to uh, take on board the principles for business and human rights. And um, I, I, I talked to uh, Rachel Kite when she was the special um, envoy on, on clean energy for the UN. And she said to me something interesting. She said, well, you see, the uh, clean energy is a new business. So they haven't really, they're making mistakes. They haven't found their way to say the least. And it, it was kind of interesting. Um, uh, it, it is incredibly important because we need to move to renewable energy, but we need to do it um, in a way that reflects um, the rights of people um, the pre-existing rights, but also the rights of access to that energy, and so on and so on. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on to questions from the audience now. Um, so for the first question, um, Mary, you just spoke about the, uh, the human rights violations with the installation of clean energy. And Vandana, you earlier spoke of offsetting the parallel uh, and the parallels with indulgences. How do we implement nature-based solutions whilst also holding fossil fuel companies accountable and, disrupt and disrupting their entrenched power? Also, in implementing nature-based solutions, how do we, um, how do these without perpetuating, how do we do these, sorry, without perpetuating injustice for landholders in the global south and perpetuating inequality in whose land should be used as carbon sinks? So perhaps, Mary, if you would like to start. Okay, um, thanks to a project um, of research from my university here in Dublin, Trinity College, I can answer a little bit. One example of good nature-based solution in Senegal um, to do with mangroves. Um, it was a project which involved a PhD student who was kind of um, mentored by my foundation on climate justice. And he brought three master's students with him master's students in development practice from Trinity. So they looked at the way that mangroves were being um, uh, recognized for their value in parts of Senegal and properly um, maintained. But they also looked at some of the abuses that were happening with the role of women, um, who, who was being consulted, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it, that project captures a lot of what can be right and what can be wrong with nature-based solutions because the, what was being done with the mangroves was the right way. It was completely embedded in the community. It was community led. It was the wisdom locally, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, around it were projects of offsetting that um, uh, um, were mentioned. Um, the projects were utterly um, you know, horrible. Um, they were offsetting by NGOs getting paid planting a thousand trees, didn't care about the quality or the land they were planted on. And then those trees would die and another project of offsetting, plant the trees again. And, plant, and they didn't even bother. It was completely to do with the wrong kind of offsetting. And it, you know, it was lovely to see this captured um, by just very observant um, eyes and ears on the ground seeing what was good about a nature-based solution with mangroves that are so important and what was awful about offsetting. And it opened my eyes to the, the, the way in which offsetting more and more is becoming another of these terrible problems in our world, that so much of it is the wrong kind of and shouldn't be allowed. Brilliant. And uh, Vandana, do you have any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the very idea of offsetting is such a Cartesian idea because every ecosystem needs to be able to function in full integrity with full diversity. And nobody should be doing the wrong thing in one place and hoping that it can be offset in another place because this is a double crime. The first crime is you continue to do the wrong thing at home that you need an offset for, you need an indulgence for. But the second is, you know, because I work with farmers on biodiversity-based solutions, and like I said, we grow more food. 
our farmers during the COVID crisis kept calling me and saying, if you hadn't got us off the addiction of growing cash crops for the market, we wouldn't be having food today. We'd be starving because the tomatoes would be rotting. There'd be no sale of potatoes. So I have, you know, I have lots of very dear friends who kind of go for these one dimensional solutions, including some people who want the idea of the soil as a carbon sink. Uh, why does that not look right to me? Uh, and the argument uses farmers are not earning enough anyway, so maybe they'll earn out of the carbon offset. I said, the place to sort this out is allow farmers to have fair incomes and fair prices for providing good food so that people have health. We need to shift from a commodity model of agriculture to a health model of agriculture and a fair price and a just price rather than a zero price. The second is the violence to the soil. You know, I come from India. We call it dhartima. Soil ecology is the richest ecosystem in the world. And it needs to be rich in the mycorrhizae, the fungi, the bacteria, the earthworms. You reduce it to a carbon sink, you're violating the role of soil in human evolution, human imagination, and human economies. The word for human is the root is humus, which is the Latin word for soil. So in fact, through this Cartesian mechanistic game playing to evade responsibility, you're basically violating the remnants of our ecological being, the remnants of our being human. Brilliant, thank you. And um, the next question that we've got is directed slightly more towards uh, Mary. So there have been a number of people um, in the audience asking about uh, decolonizing the environmental movement. Um, they say it's clear in the, in the Western world, at least, environmentalism is mostly made up of white middle class people. Um, how, do you, how do we best work to decolonize our movement and make it more inclusive and diverse? And further, um, how, do, how do we ensure that sustainable development does not perpetuate neocolonialism, which I think we've touched on earlier. So, so Mary? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I think a lot about uh, the lack of uh, real connections between movements who should, which should be connecting. Um, when I served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I didn't say anything on climate change, as I said, because another part of the UN was dealing with it. But I did bring uh, human rights experts and, and environment experts together for a sort of three-day seminar. They were delighted to be doing it. They spent the three days learning and relearning and opening their eyes and they, and they produced a report and the European, sorry, the uh, Human Rights Commission at the time would not um, adopt it. It was far too radical, far too radical. And remember uh, in 1992, we had Rio, uh, the, the original Rio conference. There is nothing in the Rio, in the, in the convention on human rights. There is one sentence in the Convention on Climate Change that is about people. And that is the one sentence that refers to current and future generations of humankind. One sentence. The following year in 1993, we had the Human Rights Conference, Global Human Rights Conference in Vienna. I was before, I was, I was president at the time. No mention of the environment practically. You know, not really. Um, and um, the human rights community is not connected with social movements in the way it should be, uh, and with environmental. And what I'm hoping, and I'm really hoping, that a kind of climate justice movement can bring us all together because we all belong in this movement that sees uh, the problems that we have had and inherited and addresses those in a way that um, is enabling us to see and to live a better future um, and a more sustainable one on all, on all sides that we can all learn from each other. I mean, every time I'm with um, Vandana, I learn uh, more. And uh, you know, on, our, on our podcast, you were wonderful as well. Uh, and Maeve and myself, you know, we're, we're delighted with, 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 your, with your contribution. But um, uh, they're, they're, sadly, um, there, there are not enough connections 
And um, I, I really think it's important now that we try to broaden that sense of um, a new world order in the best possible way. And I don't even like the word order in a way because that seems top down, but a new world bottom up um, uh, coming to terms with um, how, we, how, we, how we have a better future. Brilliant. And that also links to the ideas of allyship between different social movements. And so, so for our next question, this one's slightly more for, for Vandana. Um, and it's on the question of, uh, do you think, uh, of science, do you think that emphasizing um, listening to science promotes focus on science over integrating other knowledge systems and therefore exclusionary to some people who should be listened to on climate decisions. And you mentioned, just to add to that, you mentioned when you first uh, embarked on your career, you, you sort of got your second PhD, if you like, from the, from the Chipko movement. And so how can you, what is that balance between the so-called traditional science and that of uh, indigenous peoples? Well, you know, I mentioned early on um, about a, a rupture that took place. And it is Bacon, Newton, Descartes, they evolved, not just a worldview that we are separate from nature and we are masters of nature, but they also evolved an hierarchy of knowledges. And they're the ones who started to count what they did as science and what other did, uh, did as ignorance or superstition or whatever. Now, the word science is derived from siere, to know. So if we take this listen to science, it should be listened to anyone with knowledge. If the women of the mountains know the relationship between the trees and the forests and the water, listen to them. If the people on the coastal plains or in the Sundarbans mangrove know about what sea level rise means or what the erosion of their homes means or salinity means, listen to them. As was said long ago, it's, you can only know where the shoe pinches when you're wearing the shoe. That's the ultimate expertise. So on the nature-based solution, I think the first thing anyone who uses the term nature-based should say, we must learn from indigenous peoples. They've lived nature-based earth-centered lives. Their worldview was, we are of the earth. We are of the land and the laws of the earth determine our laws, our human rights. So I do believe bringing Science into its pluralism, which is what it means, and out of its colonial hierarchy is vital to the future. Now, those who don't know there's pluralism because they grew up in a privileged situation, you know, the only science they can see is the science that's emerged now, which often is the whole climate modeling. But there's the other sciences, the other knowledges. And for me, knowledge democracy and knowledge sovereignty and knowledge pluralism is the only way humanity will be able to build bridges to the future and overcome the divides that colonialism created. We have to decolonize knowledge. Brilliant, and we have a, we have a similar question um, saying, do you believe that the Western enforced narratives of civilization have led underdeveloped countries to industrialize in, a, in, temp, in attempts to catch up when, it is, uh, when there are other modes of development? Uh, and I, perhaps Vandana, if you'd like to start with that one. Yeah, so it's like I said, you know, having lived throughout this period of many, many transitions in India, uh, it isn't that we said give us industrialization. World Bank said you're, you're underdeveloped because you're not industrialized. Your farming is primitive, you must industrialize it with chemicals. Your clothing is primitive, you must industrialize it. You must uh, destroy your amazing textile industry, your crafts. Um, so it was originally imposed, but after a while, enough vested interests grow in society. You know, they made money out of a factory. They have made money out of selling pesticides and chemicals. So they become a lobby group to perpetuate a fossil fuel based industrial mode of, of violence against nature and violence against people. And then governments start to echo this. But Gandhi said, we don't have to go the way of the West. If a tiny island nation put the entire world in chains, what will happen if India follows that resource hungry, resource grabbing path? So we must stay light in our ecological footprint. And we must refuse to call this 
primitive. This is a more evolved way. And as he said, the earth has enough for everyone's needs, but not a few, few people's greed. So we have to definitely, but the vested interests have grown so powerful right now that the deeper democracy that I call earth democracy is the place where these shifts and corrections can happen. And that's where new leadership starts to come up. Um, Mary, did you have any comments on that question or should I move to the next one? I think move to the next one. Brilliant. Um, so, uh, so I think we'll finish with questions from the audience with uh, one, so one for Mary, which is, what do you believe is more important in tackling climate change, governmental reform and legislation or individual responsibility? And they've referenced also uh, with COVID, how that can provide a combination uh, of the two, uh, an example of the combination of the two. And then for, for Vandana, uh, what do you think about the film Planet of the Humans that have been under attack from mainstream environmental movements? So perhaps Mary, if we start with you. Okay, uh, um, I, I don't think it's an either or. Uh, I think we need, uh, we definitely need government policies now to take us forward from a broken system which was leading us to a climate catastrophe. That's what we have to remember. We were heading for a climate catastrophe, a climate extinction, whatever we want to call it. Um, and it was going to be, uh, you know, sooner than people had expected because the scientists were all warning us and the signs were coming earlier, uh, the melting in the Arctic and the Antarctic and the, the, far, the fires in, in, in Australia and in um, California and all over the place, the, the, the drought, the flooding, um, the, the deaths from, from climate change. So um, we need uh, policies that uh, are agreed um, in the imperfect system we have, but let's at least work that system as much as we can, which means working for um, ambitious uh, commitments of governments in their nationally determined contributions um, under the Paris Agreement. Um, it's not a perfect system, I admit that, but at least um, it if it can lock us in to countries um, agreeing to be zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 and all the investment, all the decision making, all the focus uh, is in that direction, that will, that will help. But we cannot do that um, at government alone um, because it requires also a change in consumption patterns, particularly in the part of the world that I'm from, um, the Europe and the United States, the uh, industrialized uh, world, uh, we had developed into a throwaway plastic ridden society. We've learned the evils of plastic. We have by no means got rid of plastic. We have a little bit, but not, uh, not really yet. Um, but we're also, I think um, as we're in lockdown over COVID, we're, we're thinking more about what is essential, which is great. We're actually thinking about family thinking about relationships. Um, there is more compassion for neighbor. I'm seeing it in this country. I'm seeing it in other countries. Um, you know, those less, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it, the, it, um, COVID is not a great leveler. It, it, it actually, in fact, exacerbates the inequalities, but it does bring out more compassion and more empathy. We have to come out of this with um, a commitment. I mean, I've already become a pescatarian. I know I'm certainly not going to travel as much as I was traveling. I was traveling because I was desperate to persuade. I now know I can use this medium much more and try and persuade as best I can. I don't need to um, have a, an increasing carbon footprint, which I'm sorry to say was being offset by the elders. And we know that's just um, not, not, not acceptable as, a, as an option. So um, I hope that uh, in the uh, parts of the world that um, uh, that developed in the way we did, there will be much more thought about the bad habits we got into of this throwaway society. Um, the, uh, what um, my friend Kumi Naidu calls our problem of affluenza, um, you know, a, a problem of affluent societies, affluenza. Um, and, uh, you know, too many um, unnecessary goods, too much packaging, all of that. But also, I think we need to. Uh, uh, think in terms of uh, the, the kind of equality that will help us to make better decisions. I hope that we will actually see 
that women led countries at the moment uh, from you know Merkel uh, in Germany, the prime ministers of Norway, Finland, Denmark, Iceland, um, Jacinta Ardern in New Zealand, the president of Taiwan, they are all managing this COVID crisis better. They've taken the tough decisions, they've um, persuaded their people, and they've talked directly to them about their need to be protective of the care workers, the health workers, um, those more vulnerable, et cetera. They've been persuasive. They've, they've, it, it has not again been perfect, but by and large, it's been um, a better example of leadership. And I think we need to recognize women's leadership as being vital for the very key decisions we have to make going forward. And I would like to see governments commit to gender balanced cabinets, um, companies commit to gender balanced boards, um, trade unions to gender balance, everybody to, uh, to gender balance going forward, because I think this will be better for um, our um, ability um, as human beings to move to a better future where we care more um, about uh, the, the real issues, the fundamental issues that we've thought more about um, in lockdown over COVID. Very quickly, because I notice it's time and my computer is giving up. It's very old and it's saying it's you have to shut down Zoom to last. It's burning. Um, so I think the whole issue of consumption has to be connected to the invisible footprint of heavy industrialism. Years ago for the UN, I did a book, Ecology and the Politics of Survival. And I'd basically drawn this diagram that here is the earth gives us everything, here are our needs, and here are our capacity to meet our needs. And every time we intervene with longer and longer and longer chains, someone does an extraction and makes a lot of money. So the distance between the earth and us gets longer and it goes further away. So the costs go further away and, uh, and they become more invisible and we become more ignorant about the costs of our consumption or the costs of industrialism. Um, I think Mary gave the example of the wind farm on the Maasai lands. That's the kind of thing I think that Planet for Humans is trying to address, that yeah. there's an ecological footprint that hasn't been taken into account. And it must, if you're talking about the earth, take the full footprint. In my book, Soil Not Oil, I had assessed at that time the biofuel option for which huge subsidies were being given. More subsidies were going for biofuel than for growing agriculture crops in America, in Europe, and that's why everything was shifting to biofuel. But it takes more fossil fuels to make the biofuel than the substitution by the biofuel. So it's a net negative energy system. So the basic message I think of that film is, let's assess the full ecological footprint, take care of human rights, take care of rights of all, and, um, and create true ecological solutions. I think a follow-up film called the humans for the planet would do good service <laughs> brilliant thank you and and just to, just to bring this uh, amazing and, and fascinating conversation to a close um i just wanted to um ask on behalf of all the students watching and all the young uh, the young people so um you both have had very very successful careers in pursuit of creating a fairer more democratic and just world but uh very interestingly you've gone about that in very different ways so Mary, you've, you've you know, studied law and gone through uh, the use of pre-existing political institutions and, and then sort of um, rocked the boat, uh, e even if that means going against the status quo. Whereas Vandana, you've taken a more bottoms up approach, empowering local communities through principles of Satyagraha led by, by Gandhi as well. And so looking back over your careers, um, ju just to end on this, um, what do you think some of the most successful moments of change were? And further, what advice would you give to a lot of the young and passionate people uh, listening of when they're asking them themselves, where can I have the most impact? Uh, drawing from lessons from your career, what, what, what advice would you give to them? Thank you. <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big, long question. And we don't have much time. Uh, I, I don't actually like thinking in terms of successes or whatever. I mean, I, I've lived my life uh, in a very unplanned way. I didn't plan the things that happened. I didn't plan to be president of Ireland. I almost said no when I was asked if I'd go forward. You know, it, 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 things happen. Much more important is, um, 
is to value those who've been with you on the way and from whom you learn so much. And I agree there very much with um, uh, uh, Nandana, that, uh, Bandana, that um, I, I have learned from indigenous peoples. I have learned from those that I wrote the book on climate justice about. Um, uh, I'm still, I must say, in a process of learning how important it is to connect the climate and biodiversity world in the more political sphere that I'm working in, especially with women leaders. Um, when I have discussions now with women leaders, they've become more aware of the climate issue and climate justice, but they don't connect it with biodiversity and protecting the, uh, the uh, and, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I think uh, the most important thing I think is to go on learning and uh, to be open to the ideas of others. Uh, that to me is, is really important. Finally, yeah, I very much like Mary's, you know, my life has flown, but the only uh, compass and guide has been my conscience, my love for the earth and my knowledge. Uh, knowledge constantly growing, I feel every day I'm in kindergarten, in <laughs> working out how amazingly sophisticated the systems of biodiversity interactions are. Um, when people say, where can I have most impact? The first thing is don't think there's only one place you can have impact. If we have to decolonize, we must get rid of the hierarchies of this thing that has more impact and this thing has less impact. Wherever your passions take you, wherever your contributions guide you, there is no work too small to make a big difference. And done with love and done with dedication, and done in a way that you allow circles around you to grow. And these circles merge with other circles and they become, as Gandhi said, never ascending, but ever expanding circles of transformation. So each of us has to do our bit, given where we are and given the challenges as we face them. And they will be bigger and bigger and they'll come faster and faster. So resilience has to be the quality of all of you and most important diversity. I think we have to get out of the silo specialization. It was specialization of expertise that made a mess of the world, but it was also a specialization in movements. And we could have done so much more if we combined biodiversity solutions and climate solutions. There wouldn't have been all this dead end roads faced again and again. I think turning the silos into bridges of new solidarities and finding that it doesn't matter where you begin, it all ends up in the same place, one beautiful earth. Well, thank you so much uh, for you both for what was an incredibly empowering discussion. I know that on behalf of everyone at OCS and everybody watching home, um, just, just thank you for Thank you for your time. I know we've gone slightly over. So thank you. And that. wonderful, wonderful <laughs> being with you again, Mary. It's always such a joy. Lots of love. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. Thank you. If you two thank just you. Um, stay on the line, I've just got um, just to 